Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. This is a no hype financial channel that is mission focused on finding you exceptional companies and unrivaled investments. Today, we are looking at a potential unrivaled company, Metro Mile. It's actually going to be going through the process of going public via a SPAC. Currently, the SPAC is Insu Acquisition Corp 2. Sounds really exciting, right? Insu Acquisition Corp. I, I love finance company, you know, the, the acquisition. Anywho, the, the ticker is INAQ. Finance people aren't that creative, in short, unless it's financial engineering. When it comes to naming, it's just like... Um, and so Insu is a $200 million SPAC, which is effectively a pile of cash just looking to do a deal. And they're going to bring Metro Mile public. Metro Mile is currently private and it's getting a lot of attention, this deal, because Chamath Paul Hapatia and Mark Cuban helped underwrite the pipe. And you can see the terms of the deal here, you know, where you have 200 million plus from, from this SPAC, then another 160 million. Chamath led this pipe. Mark Cuban's been an investor with Metro Mile for years. Um, and you can see where it's going. We're about 80%, a little over 80% is going back to the company. The rest is shareholders getting a payday. That's not what I like to see. Usually I like to see the cash getting rolled over um, and transaction expenses, which you know what? The bank has got to get paid if you know if you got to keep the machine going. This video goes out to Varun, who's an unrivaled investing journey subscriber. But before digging in, a quick plug. If you enjoy learning about potential multi-baggers, please hit subscribe. If you're already a subscriber, please hit that thumbs up. Really appreciate it right now. If you want to follow my personal journey to find potential multi-baggers, you know, the types of companies that can go up hundreds or even thousands of percent over time, go to unrivaledinvesting.com. Click on journey. Let's dive into Metro Mile. So currently you're, you're getting potential access to it. If the deal goes through, via the SPAC, which trades as INAQ. Um, Metro Mile is looking to revolutionize auto insurance worldwide. Look, hey, can we disrupt traditional auto insurance? And that's the question you wanna be asking yourself over and over while you're watching this video is, do they have what it takes to make it happen? If so, could be a, a grand slam. Um, but in order to understand Metro Mile and their history, I think it's worthwhile to actually take a little step back on our journey to understand where, where does this company come from? Where does management come from? And that actually brings us to the Climate Corporation, something that you'd not expect at all to deal with auto insurance. Yet, Dave Friedberg, poker pal of Chamath Paul Hapatia, is the chairman and also founder of Metro Mile. And he's also a founder of the Climate Corporation, a company he used to be CEO of, uh, right after he, he was working at Google. And you can read the Climate Corporation was the first provider of fully automated weather insurance products to farmers around the world. Farmers rely on good weather and without insurance, they take on massive financial risk. Makes a lot of sense. It's part of the reason why insurance industry developed over the last few hundred years. We built the Climate Corporation using the ever-increasing flow of data being generated by physical sensors connected to the internet. Satellite imagery, radar data, even data coming from farm equipment connected to the internet allowed us to use data science to make real-time predictions and offer insurance and software to help farmers reduce risk and increase profits. Okay, so quick takeaway, you need to think like, hey, this is a company well, this is the Climate Corporation we're talking about. We're not talking about Metro Mile. That took new sources of data to help disrupt a very old industry of insurance and saying, hey, we think we could better underwrite policies for farmers based on weather patterns, weather data, data that, that traditional insurance companies aren't yet incorpor incorporating in their underwriting, the amount that they charge the farmers for their insurance. And so our investors enjoyed a successful outcome for the business when we sold it to Monsanto in 2013 for $1.1 billion. Okay, so it, is, it has since become a ubiquitous software platform, platform for farmers worldwide. So like, look, hey, Dave Friedberg, he's saying, look, I've got credentials here. I succeeded here previously. This was a nice payday for our investors, successful outcome. So when you see this, you should be thinking, oh, okay, this management, they might do the same thing again where, you know what, let's build it and then let's sell it to a potential party. And that definitely is a possibility with Metro Mile. So you should be thinking the playbook is take data that the incumbents aren't using to better price them, defeat the incumbents in, you know, and take market share. And then maybe a few years out, 
sell for an exceptional investment return. That's sort of the playbook that I would think about just by knowing or reading a little bit about the climate corporation. So how is this relevant to the auto insurance field? So first you need to understand how is auto insurance currently priced? And it's currently priced based on, you know, effectively setting different classes of investors like, hey, you're a good driver. Hey, you're not a good driver. And, you know, the, whoever's assigned to that class gets a certain rate. You pay the same rate. But the reality is there's a linear relationship between the miles driven and expected losses. So everyone in this class pays this rate. But if you're driving a lot more, you're underpaying because you're more likely to get into an accident. And if you're driving a lot less, you're overpaying for insurance. And so this is their point of like 65% of drivers subsidize the other 35% that are, that are the loss makers. So the 65%, they're really overpaying. Their overpaying gives the auto insurance company the float and the, the profits that they need to pay for these, these customers that are driving too much. So is there a potential way to sort of disrupt this model? And I think you can tell where I'm going, which is that what if you have a pay per mile approach, a fat, a flat monthly rate plus a usage base um, with a charge each month. So that, that, the charge each month aspect could definitely be a win for consumers because currently, you know, if you go to something like Geico or Progressive, you pay once every six months and it's a large, you know, lump sum dollar figure potentially for a consumer. Whereas here it's like, Hey, let's look at your monthly activity. And based on that, that's what we're going to charge. And here's, you know, this is just going to the Metro mile homepage, um, where it shows like, here's your monthly rate. If this is the number of miles you do, and this is your cost per mile, this is what your monthly cost is going to be. And it shows how it's directly tied to how many miles you drive. Or if you drive 10,000 miles, you, you save $500, but you can save a lot more miles if you drive, if you can save a lot more moolah if you drive a lot less, 2,500 miles. So on average, our customers save $741 a year. So they're saying, look, our value proposition to you is by switching to this pay per mile approach using new technologies that can track how you drive, you know, how often you drive, um, we can better price it such that that 65% isn't overpaying. Um, but that's not all. There's actually a lot more functionality that they can bring to the marketplace. Um, and this is their, their point. Creates an opportunity for 65% of US drivers to save 47%. That strikes me as a very strong value proposition just on the face of it. Uh, let's keep going. So they're, they're a, a key aspect of this is that they are a tech first company. So if you build a company with a tech first approach versus a legacy approach, like a Geico, a statewide or progressive, is that when you're a science, you know, you're, you're the only data science company in the world focused on auto insurance. That's their claim. You can do cooler things. So they, they've already, we've already talked about personalized pricing on a per mile and based, based on your behavior as you're driving, you know, how do you, how do you accelerate? How do you, do you, do you, do you make those illegal, you know, right turns? Do you, do you come to a full stop at the stop sign? Um, they also have some really valuable ads for the drivers like parking ticket avoidance. Um, like, Hey, the app can tell you like, actually you shouldn't park here. You might get a ticket. You should double check that street sign. Um, and predictive maintenance, like, Hey, you might need to do this for your car based on how it's behaving. Um, and, and a claims approval automation process, which we'll talk more about in a second. They also have Metro Mile Enterprise, which is super duper interesting. I'll do a quick, you know, 10 seconds about it right here, which is saying, hey, we're looking to, to tough it out in the U.S. auto insurance industry based on us. You know, look, we're a U.S. company and we think we can compete effectively against some of these major companies. But we're not currently abroad. And what if we take our software and show international insurance companies, hey, we've done a tech first approach. You're a legacy company. You don't have, know how to do this, but you can disrupt your market using our software. So let's license out our software to you. And maybe, you know, in these, in these international markets, you completely own it, but we get paid a nice royalty or we get paid a nice licensing fee. That's really fat margins over time. So Metro Mile Enterprise strikes me as really interesting. In addition to Metro Mile, the paper mile car insurance, but that's not all. So they're also creating with through automated claims, a much smoother process 
for the end customer. And they show what the traditional process happens where you have an accident, you, you call for claims, it takes 30 minutes, then you have to schedule an appointment to bring a car to the shop. And the key point here is that 41% of customers who intend to switch insurance after a claim. So like this is the key point where a, an insurance, an auto insurance company is proving their value. Is the customer getting a good experience? And if 41% are saying, hey, we're looking to consider other insurance providers after this experience. They're saying, hey, we didn't have a good experience. Um, this is not what we wanted. Um, and versus a simple automated claims built with data science using telematics data to be like, oh, we can process this claim. You know, you, you're on your phone. This is this is the importance of a tech first company. Like maybe it's your texting and saying like, hey, I just got an accident and it quickly figures out whether or not this is fraud, um, how much to reimburse you for, how much your car is worth, all these things versus a much longer process that might involve phone calls and a fax. So why is this important? Well, the reality is their claims NPS, so net promoter score, i.e. what the customer's you know, it's, it's a way of measuring, does a customer like you? And it's a 75 net promoter score is fantastic. It means something like 75% of the customers that go through a claims process would refer Metro Mile to another customer. And the reason why having a really high NPS score is critical is it means you have effective brand ambassadors that are going to be spreading the good word, making it easier for you to grow in the future. And if you're growing in the future because you have these brand ambassadors that are preaching your name, preaching your values, you can spend less on sales and marketing to grow. That results in higher margins. Shareholders make more money. So, and, and you can see other aspects, you know, the 47% average savings, uh, the NPS score overall is 55, which is still really good. And the app store rating is 4.7. So that's, you know, they're saying like, look, this is, we, we have an overall really attractive experience. And because customers are having a good, good experience, it's going to result in more repeat business over time. At least that's what they're talking about here. Um, then they also talk about uh, the because they have a seamless automated process, they're more likely to detect fraud. Fraud discovery delivers 10% improvement in contribution margin. So the margin from those insurance from their insurance business is 10% greater. And they're saying they're effectively doing 3x better fraud discovery versus traditional insurers. So that obviously would result in a in a higher operating margin, which is something we should think about when we're looking at the valuation later on in terms of how do we value this company later on. So, you know, do they have 10x potential? That's a key filter I look at all prospective investments because I want, you know, I want big game, baby. I'm not looking for little moves. And, you know, when I'm thinking about 10x potential, they're definitely tapping into a huge market, huge potential, you know, where the U.S. automobile insurance, uh, it, you know, market is $250 billion. If they're tapping into the abroad, you know, the global market, you're looking at a total of $700 billion. So that would be, you know, getting that enterprise revenue. Um, and you can see that there's a bunch of, you know, bunch of players in the US auto insurance market, and no carrier has more than 20% market share. That means there's a lot of people that are, you know, that are roughing it out over here. You know, if, if you don't have, you know, one player that's 50% of the market, you know, that means you're going to be able to, you're more likely to be able to disrupt disrupt the players. Let's say there's a 1% player. Oh, you can maybe eat his lunch if you have a better model. Um, so, you know, they're saying over 110 carriers with greater than 100 million in premiums per year. So they're saying there's a lot of players out there that, that can get into this market and they, by having a better mousetrap, might be able to squeeze them out, crush crush a lot of these guys. That's, that's how I read it. You know, when, when you say, oh, look at all these different competitors. So is it actually possible for them to disrupt a $700 billion global industry. And, you know, the the reality is quite possibly like some of the reviews they talk about where my monthly bill is half of what I'm paying Geico. Like Geico's main shtick is like, look, by avoiding going through an insurance broker, we don't pay those premiums to the broker. You go straight to us. And if you go straight to us, then we can charge less overall. If we're charging less, you're saving more. And so here it is, they're saying, look, you're, these customers are, be, you know, here's one customer saying I'm beating Geico's pricing by half. So that, that's like, you're taking Geico's model and like squaring it. You're making it even stronger because it's a pay per mile approach. Um, you know, I always recommend Metro Mile, even over the insurance company I work for. 
Um, my six-year-old mom is on my policy and my 85-year-old grandma has her Metro Mile policy. So does my aunt. This is a really interesting point. I should get the get that ticker going where, you know, here it is, the age distribution of policies, um, you know, and you can see how a bunch, you know, over 20% um, is tied to people that are over 60. And I think this is a key element of looking at the folks that are pay per mile, which is like, yeah, does does... How often does does your 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 nana or your gaga you know go out in your automobile and and how often is she driving? Like is she is she really driving that much? Or maybe a pay per mile approach makes more sense. Maybe she doesn't you know doesn't need to drive that much. Um, and in which case maybe she's part of that sixty five percent that's overpaying what they effectively should be. And they're subsidizing that other 35% of the market. Um, what about the fundamentals? Because this, this is a no hype financial channel. I like digging into the fundamentals of every company I look at. Let's look at the potential fundamentals, um, their historic and potential fundamentals of Metro Mile. And there are actually several weird points. Like there were definitely some head scratchers. Honestly, like quick 10 second takeaway. I really, really did not like how they laid it out. Um, and I'll get into, into it in a second. Um, so first, they expect growth to accelerate from negative in 2020. So you can see here's insurance revenue. Here's 2018, 2019. You can see growth hasn't been that great. Then 2020, it's actually declined in insurance revenue. It's weird how they laid this out because revenue from enterprise segment is down here, which is below the contribution profit, which is effectively the profit. Like, are they making money off of their insurance business? Like I would prefer to put all revenue up here, whatever. Um, then they have EBS specific costs. I, it's not clearly defined what EBS is. I assume that's employee benefit specific or employee benefit solutions specific costs. Not 100% not clear. Um, so if anyone knows for sure, I'd love, love to hear it. Um, so then they say, look, this is down here, but then this is going to accelerate to 40% to 80% to 108% here. So that's that's some pretty nice growth that they're they're putting out. They, they of course, don't put those growth figures here, so I had to manually calculate that. So thank you, guys. Whatever banker this was was a jerk. Um, and so it's sort of a question of like, well, how are you doing this? And they're, you know, they, management sort of does articulate like, look, we haven't been pushing pedal to the metal to grow because we've been figuring out like, hey, how do we make sure we have a favorable contribution margin? Like, how do we make sure we're actually writing profitable insurance because once once you get that model right that you're writing profitable insurance it's actually not that hard to grow because really it's just about spending ad dollars getting people through the door to click on the platform click on you know metro mile you know putting those ads on those billboards um you know the whatever facebook ads whatever um chamath would know a thing or two about facebook advertising um and so like hey once once you have a profitable insurance product then they're saying, look, it shouldn't be that, that much of a problem getting it to scale. They're saying, you know, by, by 2023, 2024, that's actually when you're going to actually have profit. So you're going to be unprofitable all these years until 2024, which is going to be the first year where you're profitable after the cost of acquiring new potential customers. So that's, that's, is several years. You, you really are sort of making a very early investment in this company, even though it's, it's going to be publicly traded via the SPAC and you can buy effective shares in Metro Mile now. Um, and they're effectively saying by 2024, your margins, you know, 97 million on this 931 million is about 10% margin. I would love it if they had artic articulated a little better what the margins are, because this includes this revenue from the enterprise segment which doesn't really make sense to me because I would expect this to be really high margin. So what, you know, what do you think the margins are actually going to be, you know, for, for these various different segments, but that's actually not all of the head scratchers. There's, there's even more. Um, so that was, you know, this was insurance revenue. They also have gap revenue and that's, look, that's how you have to report to shareholders, um, generally accepted accounting principles, um, where it's a materially lower revenue figure. And the difference is because of reinsurance, where effectively they're saying, hey, we're not actually underwriting all this business or, or we're underwriting it, but we're not keeping it on our books. We, we pass along like half of it to a reinsurer that effectively owns it. And you have some sort of economics of like, hey, reimbursing one party for writing this insurance, but hey, it's no longer going to be if 
if this business is unprofitable, we're not the ones that are going to have to pay for it. It's the reinsurer. It's a way of offloading your risk. There are some trade-offs here. Is like one aspect is you're sort of playing with your margins a little bit because now this reinsurer is the one that gets gets that business. But another aspect um, is that this enables Metro Mile to grow faster because they don't have to have as much equity or cash on their balance sheet to write that business because they are not holding on to it. So if you're not holding on to it and you're actually reinsuring it, you can potentially grow much faster. And this is obviously, look, they're looking for 10x. They're looking to disrupt this huge market. You can disrupt faster if you have reinsurance. But what's weird is like, they're, this is their non-gap reconciliations and they don't put, once again, no percentages, no thank you to the bankers. Um, and they're not showing like what the non-gap reconciliation would be for the out years. Like why not put 2020, like you're, you're putting 2020 here. Why not put 2020 here on what the gap revenue would be? Um, seems like a very obvious thing to do. Um, but the reason why is because revenue, gap revenue is going to be much, much lower. Uh, but let, let me get into that in a second. So really, instead of $142 million in insurance revenue, which is this figure in 2021, the actual revenue or the gap revenue is projected to be $72.5 million, which removes effectively the insurance, the reinsurance aspect um, and removes interest income and enterprise segment. The enterprise segment, I, in my opinion, you could ignore. But so it's really 142.1 minus 69.5 gets you to 70, 72.5 million in, non, in, in gap revenue for 2021. Um, but what's super duper annoying is that they're not showing gap-based revenue projections. Like here, it's just showing gap revenue for 2018 and 2019. They don't put 2020. Um, and I suspect the reason why they didn't do that was because it would reflect a huge drop in gap revenue um, to 33.5 million or 36% drop. So first, like, hold on a second. Like, I have no problem, you know, management saying, hey, we think we have an awesome business model that is going to disrupt a $700 billion industry. But just like my personal take is you don't need to be slimy about it. You don't need to, you know, sort of hide key things like this. Like, yeah, you're effectively projecting gap revenue down 36%. Like you don't need to be sort of sleazy about it, in my opinion. Like it soils your reputation when you do things like this, in my opinion. Like if you look at Buffett, Buffett who owns Geico, like look, the numbers are the numbers. If if they report a bad quarter or they're down or premiums are down or their losses are up, he calls it as it is. There's no sort of masquerading what your numbers actually are and sort of, you know, putting more lipstick on it so that way it looks even better in the future. Um, that's just my personal take. So Chamath or Dave, if, if you're watching, you know, I already respect the your your investment you know records, but you know th there's a better way to present things. Like you don't you you can you can own these things in my opinion. You can be straightforward. Um, so what's up with 2020, um, where where they're effectively pointing out 36% gap revenue decline, um, not spelling it out straight out for for investors. Um, instead, it just looks like um, instead it just looks like it's flat. Um, but you need to factor in that these, you know, this adjustments to revenue is actually going up from 50 to 70 um, million. So what's actually going on with 2020? And there's less driving and on a per mile pricing basis, that means less revenue. Um, and competitors, because there's less driving, yet they already charged and they, they effectively they have their flat rate, you know, pricing, you know, hey, you're part of this class, we already build you for it. They they had super duper favorable loss ratios, you know, their business, many insurance companies had really favorable loss ratios, because people weren't getting into accidents, because they weren't driving, they're were staying at home. So they redirected it to acquiring these competitors redirected it to acquiring more policies, which in my opinion, is a potential disadvantage for Metro Mile, because hey, you have these companies with huge billion dollar budgets, 
where they can spend on ads, whereas Metro Mile doesn't have the ad spend to, to match. Um, but the key point is that less driving equals less revenue. And that here they talk about how premium per customer declined 30% due to per mile billing um, and co competitors lower loss ratios led to increasing marketing budgets and higher digital costs per acquisition. So they, it costs more to acquire customers. Um, now they may have figured out a way to potentially, you know, still beat, beat the big players at the marketing game through a targeted marketing effort. And that's why partnering with the original equipment manufacturers or the OEMs, the people that actually make the cars and they're saying, look, more and more cars are coming online and they're connected when they're produced, when the consumer buys that new car for the first time. And right now, Metro Mile has relationships with two OEMs. It's going up to eight in the, by 2022. And their goal is because you get this data that the OEMs have from selling you this car. This is an online smart car that's effectively spying on you. Um, they can market, have seamless targeted sales to low mileage drivers. Effectively saying like, hey, we can tell who are the people that aren't utilizing their car as much. A pay per mile you know, insurance model would be beautiful for them. We know exactly who to target. Um, so that could be a very clever approach to dramatically you know, increase their sales, you know, their, their insurance premiums in the years ahead. But what about the unit economics? Like, does it actually make sense currently? And the previous, you know, slides I did show showed that they did break, you know, have a break even or slightly positive 2019 gross margin on their insurance business. But I wanted to call out this slide as well. Like where they're effectively saying, look, our loss ratios are better than the auto industry and other players as well. And, and uh, this slide, and even Chamath retweeted this slide, and this also gets me into the like, ugh, guys, like you, you clearly have a really cool product, but you don't need to be sleazy about it. Um, and I, I, in my opinion, this slide is super misleading because here it is, it's taking Metro Mile, looking at the second quarter 2020, um, second quarter 2020, you're talking about April, May, and June, okay. The, the pandemic really hit the US starting in March, 2020. There was a lot of quarantine, a lot of no driving in April. So your, your loss ratios are definitely going to be more favorable if there are fewer people on the road. Yes, there, there's less driving by Metro Mile, but all, your, all the other people that you're gonna be getting into an accident with, they're not on the road. So yes, you're going to have a fav more favorable loss ratio. And then to say, look, this favorable loss ratio compares favorably to the 2019 auto average industry. Like, come on, man, don't do that. Homie, don't play that. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, anywho, I, I saw that and I was just like, ah. Oh. I, I suspect that bankers just got a little too excited on this one. They're like, ooh, Metro Ma, how do we, how do we juice these, these figures, make them look even sexier? And it's just like, just own it. Just own it. Lean into the fact that you think you have a world beating technology, but say, look, the, the recent results suck. Um, and the only reason why, you know, our, our loss ratios were good is because of the pandemic. Like own it. That's that's at least my take. Um what 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 are some of my thoughts on the valuation? So it's it's gonna be, you know, like you need to incorporate some, some of these aspects when you're thinking about underwriting a, a potential investment. And so first of all, it's going to be very unprofitable these next few years. Um, you know, where they're posting their first profit after acquisition expenses in 2024. They're looking at a huge decline in revenue, 36% decline in gap revenue in 2020. And it's not like the competition is a bunch of dummies. Like, you know, they're, they're talking about all this world beating technology, but here it is progressive, you know, the number two or three player, you know, they're talking about how they have this snapshot, you know, effectively an app, you know, you download on your phone. And, you know, look, progressive snapshot program personalizes your rate based on your actual driving. It's technically called usage based insurance. That means you pay based on how much you drive instead of just traditional factors. In most states, you get an automatic discount just for participating and a personalized rate at renewal, depending on your results. While your rate could increase with high risk driving, most drivers save with snapshot. In fact, drivers who save with snapshot save an average of 145 bucks a year. Now these savings aren't as dramatic as what Metro Mile was articulating, but you know, I wouldn't completely discount some of these underwriters. Yes, they've been around for decades. They've been around a long 
time. But is it possible that, you know, Metro Mile just completely disrupts them and they're, you know, Metro Mile is billions of dollars in premiums in the future and they just completely eat Progressive's lunch and Geico's lunch and they don't react? You know, I don't, I, I would be surprised. It's possible. It's definitely possible. Um, but by and large, I would expect you to have like that that's that's the inherent aspect of a dynamic system is that when it's dynamic your counterparties can react um and i would suspect you would get progressive leaning into snapshot marketing the heck out of it and geico to come up with their own solutions um so all these factors in my opinion need to be included in the valuation calculation you know as you're looking at this um and so let's let's do a quick take on what the valuation is you know what it could potentially potentially be in the years ahead so right now the stock is up you know it's gone up you know fairly nicely in the last few days as people are excited another chamath mark cuban stock revolutionary company why not bid it up and so you know around 13 bucks a share approximately 125 million shares outstanding i think which gets you to around 1.7 billion dollar implied valuation so hypothetical 2020 revenue you know I'm, I'm, we're getting closer to year end so i'm i'm rolling this out a year in terms of how we're looking at it so this is based on the gap revenue you know that that i'm looking at and then you know 2020 hypothetical revenue of you know 70 to 80 million um and so then, you know, what's 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 the you know optimized margins for this business? You know, I'm I'm saying potentially ten to twenty percent. Um, if anyone has a different take on this and thinks these margins should be much higher because of their reinsurance, I'm definitely open to hearing that perspective. Um, but you know, currently the way I was looking at it is that Geico, you know, in in the '90s, you you were looking at ten to fifteen percent operating margins. Part of that was from you know, the, the, the fact that they were able to earn good returns on their investment float, there's no proof that Metro Mile is going to be able to do the same, especially with a super low interest rate and interest, interest rate environment. But it's also possible that I'm dramatically um, underestimating these margins here because this is the, the, the theoretical gap revenue um, and you should be using maybe their insurance revenue, which is, you know, would, would be double this. Um, so that's, the, there is the potential there, you know, to play around with those margins there. And look, you know, before going in further in terms of how I'm modeling this out, you know, look, this is a hypothetical framework for thinking about the valuation. Um, of course, the stock price could go way higher or way lower. Um, but I, I like to have a logical framework from which I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this. So that way, if, you know, if, if on my personal investment journey, I choose to buy it, I'd like to be able to say, here's why. And logically I can track how they do on a fundamentals basis to this and be like, oh, they're, they're exceeding my expectations. You know, the stock does deserve to, to go up, you know, that sort of framework. Um, so then the, you know, estimated growth over the next five years, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying, look, um, maybe it's, you know, 30 to 50% annualized over the next five years. Who knows? You know, this past year is obviously down significantly. Um, and then once, what sort of multiple do you want to put on it? You know, I'm, I'm putting it 25 to 45 times, you know, a pretty wide range. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, they still need to prove themselves regarding execution, margins, really, really margins, in growth, like I would love to see a year or two of them deliver and say, hey, we're getting the margins that we expect, we're getting the growth that we expect, and the competitors aren't pushing back in terms of either acquiring customers or our ability to write profitable insurance. Um, and if they do an amazing job, there's definitely attractive upside. Like, look, like here I'm penciling out over 100% upside over the next five years. Um, but anything short, in my opinion, of amazing execution, performance, and even amazing valuation, to be honest, like a rich valuation a few years from now, and there's potentially meaningful downside. Like unless you get like you're really executing, I would say you, you have material downside. Um, and personally, like I'm cool waiting to get a better feel on these figures, like how this plays out in the years ahead. Now, why am I cool waiting? And part of that actually goes back to Geico, where here it is, 1951, the Commercial and Financial Chronicle newspaper, securities, you know, industry publication, where Warren Buffett wrote about the security I like best. 
And this is really a tale about how great companies, unrivaled companies, can often you know, compound over years, decades. And so it means years and years of opportunity for investors to get on board. I don't have to get on board before a company proves themselves. Of course, someone who gets in earlier should get better returns because they're taking on more risk. But I can wait. I can wait for a company to execute and deliver. And here it is, 1951, Warren Buffett, 21 years old, born August 30th, 1930. So here it is, he's writing this, 1951, 21 years old, and he's writing about government employees insurance company. And he's talking about how fast they've grown their premiums because they have an unrivaled value proposition because they have a direct consumer business model that primarily targets government employees, government employees that generally drive safer, that are better business for an insurance company. And so I, this, this just blows me away because, you know, you, you look out over the next few decades and here it is, it's 1995. You fast forward nearly a half century and Buffett acquires through Berkshire Hathaway, he acquires the other half of Geico that he doesn't own for $2.3 billion. Um, you know, and he talks about in 1951, when I was 20, I invested well over half my net worth in Geico. Mr. Buffett said in the mid 1970s, when Geico was reeling from heavy losses, Mr. Buffett sharply increased his investment, which rose in value many fold as the company recovered. Like the key point here, you know, here it was, Geico's the country's sixth largest car insurance, has been solidly profitable company in recent years with a good record for low losses and low expenses in comparison with others in its business. And it's they've had this steady value proposition where they've gone from a tiny player to the sixth largest player, now to the second largest player, and just every year gobble market share because you have a better mousetrap. And meanwhile, they've grown their premiums, so the amount of business that they've written from 8 million in 1950 to 2.8 billion in 1995 and multiples of that now. So they compounded during this time period at a 14% rate. So I, this is just a perfect example, even in the automobile insurance market, that great companies, unrivaled companies are often multi-decade opportunities, giving you the time to watch them prove themselves out prove their execution. And you know what? Maybe during that multi-decade process, you're able to get in at a reasonable valuation. And here's, here's where it cracks me up. So Buffett bought Geico outright, the other half of the, the business that he didn't already own, for 19 times earnings. Here it is. Metro Mile current price is 20 times forward sales, forward gap revenue. So earnings versus sales, pretty incredible, just, just how, how much things have changed over time, uh, especially given that at this point, like I think Metro Mile needs to execute a lot before getting that sort of multiple personally. Like I, I would like to see some execution before you know buying in at, at, at that level personally. But if you do wanna see what I am investing in, you can go to Unrivaled Investing dot com click on journey where i have exclusive content just for subscribers i recently posted something about optimal betting which is something i i think the vast majority of investors uh certainly professional investors i've asked a bunch like hey what's how, how do you what what percentage of your portfolio how do you allocate it and that's that's what this video is about um so i have exclusive educational videos just for journey subscribers you can see what i buy what i sell what i hold each month the goal is each month, this is what I'm aiming to do, is each month I'd like to find a potential multi-bagger and lay out my thesis for why it's potential multi-bagger and share that with my journey subscribers. So every month trying to find a company, a security that I think has you know several hundred percent potential. And the reality is just finding one potential multi-bagger can change your life journey. So if you're, you're interested in following my journey as I try to find these multi-baggers, Go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. If you enjoyed this video learning about Metro Mile, please subscribe if you're already a subscriber. I really do appreciate those thumbs up and thank you so much for watching.